Okay, today we continued with the discussion of open channel flow, and uh, I, I start off here with the energy equation between two points separated by a distance L, where the depth is y1 uh, upstream and y2 downstream. The um, energy equation can be rewritten using the definition of the specific energy E to be depth, that's supposed to be a y, I can't undo it. Um, so that's y uh, plus v squared over 2g. Um, in this case, we can say that e1 uh, is e1 plus s0l, that's the, the change in elevation of the bed, is equal to e2 plus sfl. Or I can rewrite this as the change in energy going downstream. So e2 minus e1 is equal to s0 minus sf times l. Okay, now, from this point, we can, we can go in a few different directions. Um, one is to say that the um, change in energy with distance, so dE by dx, would therefore be S0 minus SF. Okay, that's dividing by L and taking the limit. A second approach would be to say that um, if we're talking about uniform flow, then we know that S0 equals SF. That leads to the Manning equation that we discussed in the last lecture. Okay. We can also then use that to constrain SF in the gradually varied flow. I should note that this, this first one is gradually varied flow. So we have gradually varying flow, we have uniform flow. The third possibility is to say that we have short distances, short L, which means that E1 is equal to E2 but we're not necessarily, because I'm, I'm noting that in the case where L is small, um, S0 and minus SF is small, and, and so E1 and E2 are approximately equal. But in this case, we're not constraining us to consider uniform flow. This would be the case of rapidly varying flow. Rapidly varying flow then becomes the focus of the next couple lectures. So to... Um, follow that up here, I'm going to take the rapidly varying flow and, uh, and jump up to the top of the screen. So we have this condition that the energy is conserved, but we're not constraining ourselves to, to assume that the depth is necessarily the same. So because E of Y is equal to the depth plus Q squared over 2GY squared, where Q, little q here, is the flow per width that I introduced in lecture today, then we can think about how that function varies versus the depth. So if we think of depth versus energy, we have this um, curve that has multiple values. Um, some of the key features that we talked about today is the idea of a minimum energy that occurs at the critical point, E sub C, Y sub C, and then for a given energy greater than E sub C, say E1, we have two possible depths y1 and y1 prime. Okay. So those were the, the, the basic features of this curve. Now the last thing that we did in lecture today was to uh, evaluate where this minimum occurs. So what's the value uh, of that minimum? And, and doing that, setting the, the derivative equal to zero um, and solving for that condition, we find that the critical value, so ec or yc, occur when the Froude number, remember the Froude number is equal to velocity divided by the square root of g times depth, is equal to 1. That leads to a particular interpretation of the different branches of this curve. So to come back to the specific energy curve here, we can think about dividing it into an upper branch and a lower branch. The upper branch is the subcritical branch. It's low Froude number. The lower branch is the supercritical. We're going to talk more on Friday about the implications of those two conditions. It's divided. The, the, the key division here is in the Froude number. The Froude number equal to 1 defines those two regimes and changes the behavior because the denominator of the Froude number is the um, wave speed. So we're comparing the fluid speed to the wave speed. When that's greater than 1, the fluid is, is faster than the waves. The reverse is true when it's less than one, and that leads to different behavior 
for the subcritical and supercritical branches. So more on that in the next lecture.